presence to be here with us this morning. Lord, you are doing something in us and through us and to us. You are doing something in this church. You are building us and making us into a people, into your people. Now, Lord, as we dig into your word this morning, Lord, I just invite you to come. Holy Spirit, come into this place. Let your word become alive for us. Let it transform us. Let it affect us. Let it change us. Let it become real for us, Lord. We welcome you here this morning, Lord Jesus. We just pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week, uh, we started a new sermon series. Uh, We're going to be spending the summer with Peter uh, in the epistles of Peter, 1st and 2nd Peter. And um, uh, last week we began it, and um, the the thing that that's kind of driving uh, this over the summer is is this concept of there's so much happening around us in our world around us today. There's so much uh, change. There's so much division. There's so much stuff occurring that in any given moment it can be incredibly confusing on what's going on. Uh, many of you know we have. Uh, season tickets uh, for the Chicago Fire. You can give us our, your sympathies whenever they're bad, like really bad this year. Um, but the good thing about them being bad usually is no one goes to games anymore, which makes it relatively easy to get into the stadium, um, unlike when they're good, when people show up, or Messi comes to town, one of the two. Um, but last night we were driving in, and the weather was miserable, and I was thinking, we're just going to cut right in. This will be a piece of cake. And um, the way uh, MAPS takes us to Soldier Field is it kind of swings us to 55, and we come up 55 and get to the Soldier Field from the south. And and we're on the the feeder loop to Lakeshore Drive, and if you have no idea what I'm talking about, just nod your head, and it'll make sense in a second. And all of a sudden, traffic just stopped. Bumper to bumper traffic. And we fight all this traffic, and we're turning towards the parking deck, and it's just packed. But the weird thing about it is it's not packed with people with, like, soccer jerseys on. It's packed with people, like, with neon-colored hair and stuff. And these cars are zipping off, and people are jumping out of cars. I'm assuming they're Ubers. And they're, they're walking away from the stadium towards the lake. And I'm like, what in the world is going on? And there's a sign. Soccer park parking this way and something that I don't even remember the name of because it made absolutely no sense to me that way. And, and I'm like, what is going on? And just mass confusion all over the stadium and people dressed in, in soccer jerseys and people dressed in neon and all this stuff going on at the same time. And, and we were confused just trying to get to our parking place. And, and lo and behold, we found out that there was a concert happening on the island that's opposite where Meg's Field used to be. And so all this mass of people are there. But there was so much confusion, and so much of it didn't look like what we expected, that it, that it got confusing. It got confusing in the moment as we're trying to get into the stadium. And that's how life kind of feels right now. There's so much happening around us, so many things that we don't fully understand. We don't know how they fit into whatever. They're different, and it gets confusing for us. And we ask the question, how do we as the people of God, how do we as followers of Jesus, how do we as the church respond in a time of so much uncertainty when the things that we were comfortable with aren't always around us anymore? How do we respond in those moments? Well, Peter is writing to a church in the middle of that. They might not have had neon hair running around, but, but it was in the middle of that time where things are changing and it's getting harder to follow Jesus and, and there's pressure coming against the church. How do we do that? Last week when we began, I, I mentioned that there was a key. There was a, what we call a hermeneutical key at the beginning of First Peter, something Peter says which is a lens. It's almost a way to help us interpret the rest of the book, a saying that he put there. And he didn't put that there accidentally because he he repeats it throughout throughout the epistle over and over again. And it was this concept that we are exiles. 
I don't know if you remember it, but he started, uh, to the church in exile, to God's elect, exile scattered. And that's how we are at times. We are strangers in a strange land. We are resident aliens. We, we, we live here, but we just don't fit. So how do we live like that? Well, the problem for many of us now is when we talk about things like this, we talk about pressures and difficulties and, and being strangers in a strange land. A lot of it, in many ways, is hypothetical in our minds. Yeah, we have hardships and difficulties, but the hardships that we deal with here are nothing in, in contrast to what is happening in other places in the earth. I mean, the church right now is exploding in the Middle East. But it is not easy to be a follower of Jesus in a place like Iran where the church is multiplying. So here in America, where it's you know, challenging at times, where someone might you know, get mad at you or hurt your feelings, it, it's hard to think about what that really means. It, you know, w when you're over in another part of the world where someone might kill you, you know, persecution becomes real. Here, it's, it's sometimes more hypothetical. But the question is, how do we allow the mindset that, that is driving the church in other parts of the world where it's exploding? How do we allow that faith, that belief, that understanding of how we shall live translate into our life, into our times here in DeKalb in 2024? There's an interesting old saying that normally is attributed to music, um, but, but has multiple applications in life, and it's this. Amateurs practice until they get it right. Professionals practice until they don't get it wrong. Amateurs practice until they get it right. Professionals practice so that they don't get it wrong. Cindy and I, when we were younger, had ambition to be musicians, professional musicians, and we had opportunities and doors in front of us. And what was interesting is, um, you know, the old big fish, small pond, small fish, or big, you know, when we were hanging around the, our friends and the churches we were a part of, we were, we were pretty good. We were impressive. But you take a trip to Nashville and hang out with musicians in Nashville, and you all of a sudden discover the things you didn't know you didn't know. And you realize that to get to some of those levels, it takes work, a lot of work. And the reason why a lot of people don't become professional musicians don't break through is because when it comes down to it, they don't want to put in the work to get there. Some of it is talent. Some, I get that. But there's work. And, and most of the people that you see, that, that the superstars that make it look so easy, it's not. There was so much work done to get there. To, to get there. What's interesting is that's, an, uh, that's, a, that's a peculiar or an interesting way to look at the Christian life. If you want to get good at something, then you need to bring some stuff to the table. Your, your life needs to become preoccupied by that thing that you want to become good at. It, it needs to drive it. When I first started uh, my business career, I was working um, uh, in an office, and there was a woman in my office, little, tiny, petite, probably about this tall woman. She was a professional bodybuilder. Okay, so she was tiny and petite, but she was like, you know, like scary, strong, muscles everywhere. And what was fascinating for me was watching her do her day-to-day -day life. She, she lived in the same cubicle farm that I was in in, in the office. And, and for her, uh, there was a tremendous amount of, of, of course, exercise and activity and weightlifting that occurred in the morning and in the evening and all this other stuff. But what really drove her muscles and her strength was her diet. And, and she was building muscles at such a rate that her metabolism was, was just driving her life. It was going nonstop. She would eat 
like three times as much as I ate. And it, it, it had to be timed perfectly. She knew exactly what she was eating, when she was eating. It, it, her weightlifting, her strength building, just took control of every aspect of her life. It drove it so that she could do and compete in the things she wanted to compete in. Now, many of us, you know, we're not trying to become professional musicians or, or, or bodybuilders. But in our Christian walk, we, we struggle with that. Because this idea is, if we want to become closer to Jesus, if we want to become uh, more like Him, if we really want to thrive, then there needs to be certain focuses in our life to allow that to occur. And we find it so easy to put those focuses in other areas of our life. There are certain hobbies or, or things that we joy do that we're willing to spend the time, but we don't always want to spend it on our spiritual lives. So how do we get this right? How do we get this right? Well, Peter's going to take some time and, and look at that question. How do we live this out? If we're going to live lives as followers of Jesus in a way that honors God and keeps in mind that He is Lord, that He is in control, then there are certain things that need to shift in our lives. We need to shift our focus towards some things and away from, from other things. And Peter's going to give us three things that we need to shift our attention towards. So if you have a Bible, open it up to 1 Peter chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 13. It's on the screen, or hopefully will be on the screen. If you have a Bible, bring a Bible. I'm a little old school though. 1 Peter 1.13 Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. The first area that Peter challenges us with is our mind. We, lived in a, we live in a world where distractions are abound. They are everywhere. Uh, this Lent, uh, when we were fasting, I fasted social media. I just I took it off my phone. And I thought this will be an easy fast, a piece of cake. And for the first couple weeks, it was, it was almost like I had an amputation. I kept looking for things on my phone. I didn't know what to do. It drove me crazy. But the discovery I made that over time, I discovered that all of a sudden I had more time available to me. Um, my, my main reason for it is, is my, my second job, there's a lot of free time in it, and social media was how we wasted time at, at the car wash, watching videos, flipping through Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or whatever. All of a sudden, I wasn't doing it there. And for the first couple weeks, I was bored to death. I was just like staring aimlessly, and my coworkers would be there scrolling, scrolling, and I'd be like. And then I discovered something, something that I forgot, something that I forgot how to do, and that was read. I, this is just an interesting concept. I did, rediscovered that I could bring a book to work and read and like learn. I discovered that I could spend time and pray. And all of a sudden, my prayer life started to expand. I discovered that I could take some time and just sit still and be with the Lord and allow Him to come and speak to me. And all of a sudden, that started to expand. Because the distractions that I had that were keeping me all away from that, the distractions that really weren't that important, I kind of pushed out. Now all this room opened itself up again. We've become addicted to the trivial. We become addicted to the things that are not important. 
How many times are you passing videos or you need to see the newest, latest video of something stupid? I, I was with ben, or Nathan. We're, we're looking to buy a car and we were waiting for the financing all to come together yesterday. And the guy came and he started talking to us about, about blades for wind turbines and how they're not uh, uh, recyclable and how they bury them in the ground. And he had to show us these videos as we're sitting there waiting. And I'm sitting there going, why do I care that they're burying wind turbines? turbines in the ground when I'm trying to buy a car. But that's where we are. We're addicted to the trivial. And, and all those distractions around us, all of a sudden we can discover we quickly lose focus on God. The, the English Standard Version of this uh, says this, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. That the Greek it gives this imagery of, of girding up, like you're preparing for battle. In, in ancient times, when they were wearing more like cloaks, cloaks were great for walking around and taking your time, but when you needed to run and you needed to go into battle, and I'm assuming, ladies, you, you understand this, it's difficult to do that in a long cloak. And so what they would do is they would, they would take the cloak and they would pull it between their legs and tie it into their belt and gird it up so that they could have more movement and more flexibility so that they can run, so that they were prepared for the action that was about to occur. Are you prepared for the action that God is wanting to do in your life, that Jesus is calling us towards? Look, this isn't just a call to good thinking. This is a call to be prepared for doing. We talk a lot about doing the stuff, but the problem is, is that we're never prepared in our minds to do what God wants us to do. We're so distracted with everything else around us that we miss the opportunities that God places in front of us. We miss the people who might need prayer. We miss the people who might need just a simple word. We miss people because we live such a distracted life. Peter continues this, and he says to be fully sober. And we, think, we hear that and we're thinking, okay, so he doesn't want us to drink and he wants us to think right. That's not what he's talking about. He's not talking just about physical drunkenness. He's talking about letting our minds wander into any other kind of intoxication or addiction that prevents us from being spiritually alert or aware. He's talking about us being lazy in our minds. When you have a clouded mind, you're not paying attention. You're not focused. And there are so many things out there that are vying for our attention. It is so easy to lose our spiritual concentration through the mental intoxication that this world is pumping into us. In the spring, we looked at the, the five habits of how to be missional, right? You know, bless three people, eat with three people, spend a period of time learning about Jesus, spend a period of time listening to the Holy Spirit, spend a period of time journaling about how God used you, how the Holy Spirit used you. Notice what those five things are doing. They're forcing you to be alert, to pay attention. And my gut is, it was easy to forget those five things no matter how simple they were. Because there was so much swirling around you, so much distraction, so much things that were intoxicating your mind so that you couldn't pay attention to what the Lord wanted you to do. That is the challenge of our day. Peter goes on to say that we're set to set our mind on the hope that has been promised to us, the hope on the grace that we're to receive. That hope is what drives our action. That picture that, that Jesus is going to make everything right upon His return. And we know that any moment we can experience that breakthrough. So that means that we need to be aware. We need to be paying attention. We need to be sharp. We need to be aware that the kingdom can break through at any moment. And we need to be ready to act upon those moments. When you're at work, when you're at the store, when you're just in your neighborhood, when you're at home, when you're with whomever. Any moment 
God may be ready to work. And we miss it. We miss it. Now the second area that we need to focus on is our behavior. Verse 14. As obedient children, do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Peter is calling us to a life that is characterized by obedience to Jesus. Not just thinking a new way, but acting in a new way. Your actions are important. Sometimes I don't think we fully understand that. Your actions define not only who you are to the outside world, but it defines what you believe to the outside world. The reality is that for many people, you may be the only Bible that people read based on your actions. So how do you want people to see Jesus? How do you want them to understand who Jesus is? We're at the car wash. Once again, another car wash story. Last week. Last week was a really interesting week at the car wash. And um, a guy who I know, who's a believer, came through and he was talking with my coworker. And uh, I asked just a basic question, you know, so how are things going? And he went down this, this thing, told us a story about his son who got injured in the, in the military and went on to some difficulties he had getting proper uh, uh, support uh, from the, the military after his injury. And then he kind of went on in a rant. And he walked his way down a path that got very political and very... very common to what we hear today. And he knows I'm a pastor. And he's friends with people who are friends with me that are also pastors. And he looked at me and he goes, don't you agree? And uh, like I said last week, I'm really good at disappointing people. Um, I just kind of shrugged. And I was like, well, and he goes, you're just going to go on and talk about Jesus again, aren't you? That how we really just need to focus on God and Jesus and not all this other garbage, right? And I go, well, yeah. <laughs> Basically, yeah. You're the only Bible people are going to see sometimes. And they bring all kinds of ideas. And, and I'm not saying they're right. I'm not saying they're wrong. But, but they're not Jesus. They're not Jesus. And it's so easy to run down the rabbit trails that are all around us. And I don't, I don't care what the political issue is. There are rabbit trails everywhere, and none of them lead to Jesus. We follow not only a risen Savior, but a Savior who is King and Lord. And so our lives should be lived in such a way like Jesus is actually alive. And not only is he alive, but he is king, and he is ruler, and he is Lord. And that is why we are exiles. That is why we live as strangers in a strange land, because our allegiance is to him. And so our lives should look different like they are aligned to him. See, Peter's looking at this as this is something we should be doing in response to God's mercy towards us. As we received His mercy, Peter is saying, since God is holy, we should be living holy as well. And the word holy, I know, can become confusing. We, we get confused on what that means. It simply means separate. That we should leave separate to sin, but we should also leave Lead or live separate to God. Our lives should be separate, focused on Jesus. We're not supposed to live like those around us. We're supposed to live differently. Our priorities, our focuses, our allegiances should be different. Our desires should be different. 
Our hopes, our dreams should be different. Verse 17, since you call on a father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. Yes, God is the judge. And the word fear means fear, but it also means something else. Fear can mean a couple of different things. Fear can mean being afraid of God. But fear also has a different meaning that I think is more appropriate here. And it's a way that we should be living. When you're driving down the road, and you're not paying attention, and your speedometer is maybe 10 miles per hour over what the speed limit is, and, and that, that car, you know, the one with the lights, is on the side, right? What do you do? You just fly by it and wave? No, you quickly take your foot off the gas. And you, I don't want to hit the brake because if he sees me hit the brake, then he's, you know, I'll just coast it down and maybe you won't notice. And then you're looking in your rear view mirror, right? Making sure that he's not pulling out. That's fear, but it's not fear that you're afraid. It's fear that you're in awe. You're, you're concerned. You're in awe of the power that that cop has to ruin your day. We need to be a place of awe on who God is. We need to live in a place of awe on who Jesus is. Not just take him for granted, but, but step back for a moment and go, okay, I am trying to follow the God of the universe. I am trying to follow the Lord of Lords and King of Kings, the resurrected Savior. That should put me in a place of awe. I am not God. There's a song we sing that I love that has a bridge that's more of him and less of me. It's a quote from John the Baptist. When, when John's disciples said, hey, Jesus is baptizing. You were baptizing first. You need to take your, your, your rightful place and kick him out. And John looks at his disciples and said, more of him and less of me. That's living in awe of who God is. And sometimes I think we just take God for, for granted. We take Jesus for granted. He's just someone who was here many years ago. He's at a distance. We get to go to heaven. He died on the cross for us. Praise Jesus. But after that, it's like we get to do whatever we want to do. No, following him means we are in obedience to him. We are in a place of awe to him. P Peter is calling us at this place to take our actions in account during our time as exiles here. This is Exodus imagery that he's pulling in. This imagery uh, uh, from Exodus, when there was the cloud of, of smoke and the, the fire and the sense of awe that if they did something wrong, the power of God would come to them. They, they, they wanted to follow God. They knew God had redeemed them. He had delivered them. But he also realized that this was a holy God that they were following. And so their actions had consequences. Their actions had meaning. He wants us to get that. Our response to God has meaning. Verse 18. For you know that it was not with perishable things, such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed from an empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. We were purchased for a great cost. We celebrated communion this morning, remembering that cost. He didn't purchase us with money or gold or silver, but with blood. There was a huge cost involved. And when we consider all of this, when we consider our actions and what they mean towards others, in light of who God is, in light of the price that he paid for us, is it really a big deal that we're called to be more obedient to Jesus? When we consider the cost when we consider the mercy and the hope we have, is it really that difficult? 
to say we should be more obedient to his ways? Now, Peter wants to get to the final point, verse 22. Now that you have purified yourself by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. The final point here is that we need to focus on love. We can have all of our spiritual ducks in a row, but if we are not growing in love, we are missing it. There's an old story in the church that comes back from the church fathers that talks about the Apostle John in his last days. He's in Pantamos, and his, his disciples are with him, and he's teaching them. And, and in his final days, he was able to, um, to basically bring the gospel down to one simple sentence, following Jesus down to one simple thing. And, and it was this. He used to tell them, little children, uh, love one another. Love one another. If we obey that commandment, he would say, it would be enough. All the distilled wisdom of the New Testament, he, he, he distilled it down to that. Love one another. Paul thought the same way. 1 Corinthians, there's this huge discussion on the spiritual gifts. And in the middle of that discussion, that we love that discussion on the spiritual gifts, in the middle of it, he, he breaks off to this thing that we only bring out at weddings. But it actually has absolutely nothing to do with a wedding. It has absolutely nothing to do with weddings. It has to do with following Jesus. 1 Corinthians 13.1 If I speak... In the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. We tend to focus on all the stuff we can do, but we miss the most important part. We desire to operate in the fivefold gifts, and, and somehow in those, we think we can move to some kind of pinnacle of faith. Right? The teacher, he wants more knowledge. The pastor wants more flock. The evangelism wants more of the lost. The, the prophet wants more spiritual experiences. The, the apostle wants more grand movements of God. But all of those can be accomplished on our own strength and in our own will. As the headlines around the church show today, we can accomplish great ends and absolutely mess up the means. We can do great things, but without love, they end up being meaningless. We can build massive churches, but without love, they become empty shells. Peter wants to get through to us is that it's not what we do. It's how we accomplish it. And as we look at those three things, that's the key. How do we accomplish it? Now it all comes down to three things. Thinking right, walking right, loving right. And when we hear this, we, we may feel like we're moving from, from this, this idea of grace towards work, like, like Peter's adding things for you to do, like giving you a checklist. So, so great, i got to believe in Jesus... Now I gotta like think differently and I gotta act differently and I gotta love differently and all this extra burden that I gotta do, right? But Peter ends this section with a really interesting twist. This isn't about what you do, this is about what and who you've become. Verse 23. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and all their glory 
is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. You have been born again. If you've been born again, there should have been a transformation that occurred in you or that is occurring inside of you. There's this crazy desire in the church that, that we want Jesus to meet us as we are and love us as we are and leave us as we are. We want Jesus to come and pat us on the back and say, you know what, you're okay. You're okay with me. There's a meme out there with the thumbs up Jesus. That's what we kind of want. But that's not Jesus' plan for us. Jesus didn't die on the cross so that we can just, you know, do what we want to do and keep being what we want to be. Jesus died on the cross so that we could become what we were created to be. We were all born initially with perishable seed. As Peter quotes from Isaiah, Isaiah I'm turning South African. The book of Isaiah. Isaiah. People are like grass, and their glory withers and falls away. As I get older, that becomes a lot more real. Cindy, uh, Cindy has been working in hospice for the last couple of years, and, and this kind of was reinforced while she was a chaplain, but now that she's in charge of bereavement, uh, it has become more real. I mean, her job is to spend time with people who have lost. And um, what has struck me is how fragile life is. How quickly we can lose in a moment. How, how much like grass our life is. It, it may flower and bloom and in an instant be gone. But as flower, followers of Jesus, we've been born again. Not with perishable seed, but with the imperishable. The seed that will last forever. Our hope is not in today and the here and now. Our hope is in the kingdom that is coming. Our hope is in the new heaven and the new earth that is coming. But the reality is, is those two seeds, those two kingdoms are battling within us. Paul in Romans 7 talks about how he wants to do what is right, what is good, but evil is right beside him. It is fighting him. And the enemy's goal is to have you forget who you were made to be. Forget that the imperishable is in you and instead focus on the perishable. To focus on the ends and forget the means. And the enemy's main tool is fear. Oh, think what you're going to lose. Think what they're going to, you know, they're taking away your rights. If you follow God, think of all the fun you're going to miss. Look, this year, fear is going to be plentiful. 2024 will be the year of fear because we have a big election coming, and the way people get elected is through fear. Either side of the party, it's fear or of, of the political spectrum. But you've been called to something higher. You've been called to live out the gospel, to be an agent of transformation to the world. And to do that, we need to move from being amateurs and become professionals. We need to live in a way where we strive not to get it right, but instead where we live, where we're not getting it wrong. We, to do this, we need to recognize and eliminate the distractions that are taking our focus away. We need to be in the right mind. We need to be focused. Not just uh, thinking in a new way, but also living in a new way. Allowing our actions to proclaim the gospel to the world. And finally, remembering that all we do, all we say, all we think needs to be rooted in love. This is what our faith looks like. This is what living it out should be defined by. And living this way is counter to what our culture tells us. Our culture tells us that those distractions 
are our rights. You have a right to those distractions. And if you don't embrace those distractions, then you're just not like hip or cool or in the right crowd. You're missing out. Our culture tells us that living a holy life is just for losers. I mean, embrace your freedom. Do what you feel seems right for you to do. Doesn't Paul say something about, you know, freedom? Do whatever you want. Our culture tells us that that love is for the weak. Instead, we need to embrace our offense. And if we're honest with ourselves, most of us have embraced some of those lies that our culture has told us. Our our culture tells us another lie, that that God, if, if he exists, is a million miles away from us, that he's really disinterested in what happens to us, that that we'll deal with him in the by and by. And because of that, we need to depend on either ourselves or on someone or something else for our deliverance or for our provision. But when we embrace the life that our culture offers us, we embrace the lie. We may say we believe, but we act as if we're indifferent. But Jesus has called us to live a different way. To be holy, just as He is holy. To place our sole allegiance to Him, not to the kingdoms of the world. And and maybe that is why we live in a time such as this. A time where we need to decide, how then should we live out our faith? Jesus is calling us to become a community that lives differently. A community that thinks, acts, and loves differently, a community that lives counter to the world around it, a community that lives like Jesus is not only alive, but that he is our Lord and our King. Living like this is counter to what our culture thinks and acts. And it might be even counter to some, how some of the other churches think and act. But living our lives this way, way makes us available to God. And when we're available to God, God can do incredible things through us and in us and around us. So, how's your mind? I like that thought, that picture the world intoxicating our mind. We need to take a moment, maybe, and stand up and say, Hi, I'm Joe. I've got an issue with, uh, with the trivial in the world. How, how is your walk? Are you in awe of Jesus? Are you in awe of who God is and what he has done? How does love look like right now in your life? Are you defined by love or by offense? We are called to be a community that thinks, acts, and loves. And when we do that, then we are so pliable. God can do so much through us. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we just welcome you into this room this morning. Lord, I'm not going to pretend that this is an easy word, but I believe that this is a word for our time, for our place. Lord, there is so much stirring around us right now, so much distraction, 
so much division, so much hatred, so much indifference. But Lord, I ask, create in us the community that you desire us to be. Make us the people that you want us to be. Make our lives defined by you. Lord, where there is distraction in our minds, where our minds are intoxicated by all the noise and trivia around us, Lord, help us. Help us identify it. Help us repent of it. Help us remove it so that we can be focused on you. So that we can be ready for action for you. Lord, where our life and our walk has been uh, defined by indifference, Lord, help us be defined by awe of you. Lord, as you are holy, help us to become holy as well. Lord, I know we can't do it on ourselves. We cannot live holy lives on our own work and what we do. We can only do that through the work that you do within us. So, Lord, come and begin a work within us, in, within this church and within us individually. Lord, begin to sanctify us, begin to transform us, begin to change us. Help us live in a way where where we are proclaiming the gospel to the world through our lives. Finally, Lord, help us learn how to love. Lord, you've called us to, to love our enemies someone strikes you on one cheek, we're to give them the other cheek. We're supposed to bless those who curse us, Lord. And that is so hard to do in our culture. Lord, allow that to become how we are defined as a community that loves. So Holy Spirit, come. Come into this place. Begin to work into in our lives. Begin to change us. Begin to transform us. Begin to make us into your people. We thank you, Lord Jesus. If you need prayer this morning, I know this is hard. I know it. 